hiding from the Midianites, hiding from our enemies. And so where are the promises of God? And so we're going to talk tonight about, about manifesting the power of God, manifesting the promises of God, finding the things that God has promised us to come into our lives. Because, see, I, 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 I get tired of people always talking about what God is going to do. We need to be talking about what God has done and what God is doing in our lives. And so when we realize how to manifest the power, the promises of God in our lives, then people will see the glory of God operating in us and through us. And we'll draw people. The Bible says that men may see your good work. Let your light so shine that men may see your good works and glorify the Father. So God wants to fulfill everything that he promised. The Bible said that Abraham was fully persuaded that whatever God had promised, he was also able to perform. And he was called the father of the faithful. So I want to talk tonight about manifesting. There are some things that we need to do to cause the promises of God to be manifest in our life. So I want to talk about three things that we need to understand when we're focusing on the promises of God being fulfilled in our life. The first thing we want to talk about is the reality of the spirit world. See, we are familiar with our natural world, and we are familiar with the paradise of God. But we need to be familiar that there is a spirit world. There is a place that's, um, that, that's, that's, that's in, in, invisible, but it's real. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. The next thing we're going to talk about is the power of the spoken word of God. It's important that we not just know what God said and believe what God says, but our faith is activated by the things that we say and the things that we do, and primarily by the things that we say, because the things that we say be, can, can go, your, your voice can go places where you can't go, and your faith can go places you can't go. So we activate our faith by speaking the word of God. And the third thing that we want to talk about is the power of consistency. Don't be so quick to give up because you don't see the manifestation happening at the time you think that it ought to happen. So we're going to start off tonight in the scripture of 2 Peter, chapter number 1, verses 2 through 4. We are talking about manifesting the promises of God. Peter said, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Now, I'm going to stop right there because you all know that that's one of my pet peeves right there is that the people of God are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. The people of God are led into captivity because they have no knowledge. And people are too, are too lazy sometimes to seek after the knowledge of God. They seek after God. But they don't know to seek out the God. You got to seek out the knowledge of God so that you would know how God operates, so that you would know what God has said. See, God doesn't do what you want him to do. God does what he promised to do. And so a lot of times people get disappointed in God because God doesn't do what they always wanted him to do. But God honors his word. And you have to find out what his word is. So he said peace and grace is multiplied in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord as his divine power has given to us all things. Can anybody say all things? all things? All things that pertain to life and all things that pertain to godliness. And how does he provide it? Through the what? Knowledge. There's that word again. Through the knowledge of him who called us to glory and virtue, by which have, give, have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of his divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world that is in the world through lust. Pat, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Lust of the world can lead you into corruption, a corrupt lifestyle. But rather than living a life of corruption, God wants us to live about his divine nature. What we want to see here is that God has given to us, not God will give to us, but God has given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. Now, that might seem like a small thing. He didn't say he has given to us exceedingly great and precious things. It said he has given us exceedingly great precious 
promises. Now the things are contained in the promises. But you, when you fulfill the promise, you start seeing the things. But he said that God has given to us. So now I have a question to you. If God has given us exceedingly great and precious promises and we don't see them in our life, where are they? If God has given, but we don't see it, where are they? I have another question. If God promised by his stripes we are healed, then why are we still sick? I mean, if God promised it, and the Bible said every promise of God is yes and amen, he didn't say you wouldn't get sick because you wouldn't need healing if you'd ever get sick. But once you get sick, you are entitled to healing. And I firmly believe it's always God's will to heal. Amen. Now, it, the healing doesn't always take place. But the reason I believe it's always God's will to heal us is because when they carried people to Jesus, he never turned anybody away. I didn't see anywhere where he told somebody, I can't heal that one. I, I didn't see where he said, that sickness right there is one that I can't heal. Even when somebody was dead, Jesus Christ could raise them from the dead. So I believe, and I believe that healing belongs to the people of God. And I'm not trying to come against anybody that does not get healed. I'm not saying that because sometimes people don't want to be healed. I have seen a situation where somebody just was ready to go home with the Lord because they were tired. They had, they had lived their life on this side. They had done what they felt like they were called to do, and they were ready. I've seen more than one person. They were ready. They just laid there and waited on death to show up because they believed to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. So sometimes when you pray for people to be here, that's not what they want. Amen. They be ready to go on and be with the Lord. And Paul, one time, Paul said that I'd rather go and be with the Lord. He said, but for your sake, I'll stay here. So death is not uh, 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 something that a Christian has to fear because it's actually the doorway to something better than where you are. And I know that's hard to receive, but that's the truth. That's the word of God. So if every promise of God is yes and amen. My question is, where are the promises? Why, does, why do we not see the promises that God has given in our lives automatically? And I think this is a legitimate question. Some people say, well, you don't ever question God. Why not? I don't think God get intimidated because you ask him a question. If you're asking him a question for knowledge is one thing, but when you ask him a question as a, um, a in doubt, that's a different thing. Because see, whenever, uh, when Mary asked the angel, how can these things be? Whenever the angel told her she was going to have a baby, she said, how can these things be? Seeing I know not a man. What the angel did was he explained to her what was going to happen. But now Zachariah said, give me a sign that these things are going to come to pass. And God did. God shut his mouth. Yeah. Amen. He couldn't speak until the baby was born. See, it depends upon your question is a question of info, that you need information or a question you would doubt or challenge God. So you have to realize that God is not intimidated by our question because if we want understanding, God will give us understanding. But if you want God to show you to, to try to display himself, the Bible says, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So we're asking a legitimate question, and that is where is the promises that God gave us? If he's already given, the scripture says he has given to us exceedingly precious and great promises. That means he's already done what he said he was going to do. Now, I'm here to tell you that there is not only a space, but uh, there's not only a space between the time that the promise is given and the promise is fulfilled, there is a place between the time that the promise is given and the promise is received. Now, the best example that I could come up with when I was doing this and meditating on it is like, for instance, a, a parent might give their child a trust. They might say, I'm going to set aside $5 million for my child, and it's but I'm putting it in trust. Now, 
in order for the child to receive the trust, the trust is already there now. So the child is already a millionaire because the, the parents said uh, that I'm setting aside this $5 million. But in order for the child to actually receive it, the child got to reach a certain age. So that takes care of the space, the time. See, at the same time, that trust, that money is put into a particular place so that when the child get ready for it, it'll already be there. I'm trying to show you. The promises of God is yes and amen. But there is a space and a place that we got to deal with in order to see the promises manifest in our lives. Do we get that? Amen. Amen. I want you to go to Matthew chapter number 16. Very familiar scripture. Um, we talk about it a lot, and not only in this ministry, but probably almost every other ministry talks about it a lot. Man, it's the corner, one of the cornerstones for the building of the church or the ministry. Matthew 16, beginning at verse 16. And I'm not going to go into all of it where Jesus asked his disciples, whom do men say that I am? And asked Peter, whom do you say that I am? Or asked the disciples, whom do you say that I am? And then Simon Peter said, verse 16, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now I want you to go over to chapter number 18 in Matthew. <coughs> and let's go down to verse number 15. He says, Moreover, if your brother sin against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear you, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you as a heathen and a tax collector. Assuredly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Now, I wanted to bring those two scriptures to you where the promise was made that whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Now, in the first situation, he told Peter, I've given you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. So whatever the kingdom of heaven bind on earth, I will bind it in heaven. Whatever the kingdom of heaven loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Then he said, I'm taking it to the church. And he said, whatever the church bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven, and whatever the church loose, in, I'm telling you, I just want to do that to reiterate my teaching, that the kingdom of heaven and the church is the same thing. Yes. That same authority. And he wasn't giving that authority just to Peter. That's where it sounded like over in chapter 18, in chapter 16. But in chapter 18, he said, two of you shall agree on earth, touching anything that they ask, it shall be done. So he let them know that the authority didn't just belong to Peter, if it did, when Peter died, the authority would have been gone. But he did it to the church. Now look at what he says. I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now I've heard preachers, many preachers, famous preachers, say that, that means that whatever is already bound in heaven, we can bind it on earth. Now, I, English has not always been that was one of my weakest subjects in school. I was, I was pretty good in math. But I think I understand past tense and future tense. Because he said, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound 
in heaven. It didn't say whatever's already bound in heaven, now you can bind it on earth. That's not what it says. I mean, I can understand a little better than that. But see, the reason that they say it that way is because they believe that the heaven that Jesus was talking about is talking about the third heaven, which is the paradise of God. Go with me to, um, I believe it's uh, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. And, and I'm going to start looking at, um, let's see, I don't even know if I wrote it on my list. I don't think I did. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. Let's start looking at verse number 1. He says, now concerning spiritual gifts, I went to 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Pastor Anderson. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at the first verse. He said, it is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out the body I do not know, God knows. Such a one was called up into the third heavens. Did y'all hear that? Was called up into the third heavens. He says, and I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. How he was caught up into the what? Paradise. And heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for man to utter. So the third heaven is known as paradise. That's where we go when we die. Absent from the body is present with the Lord. So we go into the paradise of God which is the third heaven. Now, if there's a third heaven, just by deduction, I know that there must be a first heaven and there must be a second heaven. All right, let's go to Genesis chapter number one. Genesis chapter one. And let's start looking at verse number six. It says, then God said... <coughs> Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament what? Heaven. So the evening and the morning were the first day. So we realize that when the Bible talks about whenever... Uh, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. He said, the earth was void. Everything was water. So what God did was he separated the water above and he separated water below. And in the middle, that space in the middle was firmament and he called that heaven. So that's the first heaven. So we see the first heaven is talking about up in the sky. And I don't care how far up you look, you're just going to be looking in the first heaven. Because I've heard people say that the second heaven like the first heaven might stop at Pluto and then the next heaven goes on up to the other disciples and stuff, other areas and stuff like that. And so they, they, they divided the, the first and second heaven into two things. But there's no scripture for that. That's what they come to the conclusion because they don't know where the second heaven is. <laughs> so the first heaven is talking about up in the sky. As far as the universe can go, that's still the first heaven. It's a vast place. But that's the first heaven. All right, the third heaven is the paradise of God. So where is the second heaven? I'm glad you asked. The second heaven is a place where there are demonic spirits and there are angels at work in the spirit realm. It's a heavenly place. But it is not the first heaven and it is not the third heaven. It's the second heaven. The second heaven is talking about the spirit realm. Now, Jesus said, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. All right? What is it that we need to bind on earth that need to be bound in the paradise of God? Can anybody think of anything? If, if it's the paradise of God, there's nothing that we need to bind up there, right? 
All right. If we bind up in the area where the moon, the sun, and the stars are, how is that going to affect our life? What can we bind up there in the, in, the, in the elements? What can we loose up there in the elements that's going to affect our lives? So it's not talking about the first heaven. I submit to you that the second heaven is talking about the paradise of God. Let's look at, um, let me find this scripture. I'm sorry. The second heaven is the spirit realm where there are demonic forces going on and where there are angels going on. Look at, um, let me see this first scripture. Go to Hebrews chapter number one. Hebrews chapter number one. And verse 13 and 14. He says, but to which of the angels say he, which of the angels has he ever said, sit on my right hand till I make your enemies my footstool, your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits, talking about the angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? When we use our authority to bind on earth, we can bind demonic forces from having impact on our lives. Because what happens in the spirit is manifested in the natural. At the same time, we have the authority to lose angels so that they may work on our behalf. That's why when we get ready to travel, what we do, we ask our angels to go before us and clear the way. Go before us so that when the traffic happens, it happens before we get there. Or it may happen after we get there. But we use our authority to speak to the angels and ask the angels to minister on our behalf. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. I want you to get this. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with what? Every what? Spiritual blessing. Where? In the heavenly place in Christ. So the heavenly place is talking about that spirit realm. And that's where your blessings are. So if you want your blessings, what you have to do is find out where they are and how to get them. And the way that we, we operate in transferring from the spirit realm to the natural realm is by faith using the word of God, the spoken word of God. Look at, um, look at Mark chapter number 11. All the promises of God, all the promises of God start out as spiritual blessings. And they start out as spiritual blessings in the spirit realm. They become natural blessings when we transfer them from the spirit realm into the natural. Because see, we, we, we live in the natural. But if your promise is over in the spiritual, you need to transfer it from the spiritual to the natural where you are. And look at this. Everything starts out in the spirit. This podium started out in the spirit. It started out in somebody's heart, somebody's mind, and then they put it together and it became natural. But it had to start out in the spirit first. See, everything comes out of the mind of God. Everything, that, the, all the blessings that God has for you come from the thought and the heart of God. And God has stored them up for you in that spiritual realm, which is, I believe, the second heaven. That's where it is. And that's where God stores it up. Now, we got to learn to transfer it from where God put it to where we want it and where we need it. Okay, Mark chapter number 11. All right, verse 22. This is Jesus speaking. He said, have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed <clears throat> and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believe that those things which he says will be done, he will have whatsoever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever thing you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Speaking activates our faith. 
Your faith is activated either by what you believe, by what you say, or by what you do. Faith has to be activated. If it's not activated, it's what James called dead faith. So when we speak, we activate our faith. You got to believe it first. And then you speak it, and then you expect it to happen. Proverbs 18, 20. You don't have to turn to this. You can write it down if you want to. It says the power of death and life is in our tongue. So when we speak life, we'll see life manifested. It's power in what you say. Matthew 8, chapter and verse 16. It says that Jesus cast out devils and healed with his word. Be careful what you allow to come out of your mouth. You can be trapped by what you say. Don't agree with somebody that says something negative about you. Amen. Don't get an agreement with them because there's power in agreement too. Find somebody that will agree with you when you say what God says because there is power in agreement. That's why the devil don't like marriages and don't want the husband and the wife both to be saved because when you got a saved husband and you got a saved wife and both of them believe the word of God, we can bind, what, we can bind the devil. We can stop the devil from doing things in our home because there's power of unity. And we're holding on to the word of God. So that's why the devil wants these men to stay home. And that's why he, he wants division in the home because the devil works through division where God works through unity. So when you find you a prayer partner, find somebody that can agree with what you, if you don't have a husband, you don't have a wife, find you somebody that will agree with you in the word of God. And speak the word, speak the word, speak the word over your situation. Because God honors what we say. Okay? In the book of Genesis, you don't have to turn to this one either. Chapter 1, and you can look at beginning at verse number 3, verse number 6, verse number 9. There are other verses in there. The Bible says, and God said. When God got ready to create the earth, he said, and God said, let there be. And God got what he said. See, God spoke it, and the Holy Spirit manifested it. Now, we have the, same, have the same Holy Spirit on the inside of us that was there when the world began. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells on the inside of us. That same Holy Spirit is waiting on us to speak a word because the Holy Spirit honors the word of God. And a word spoken in faith activates the Holy Spirit. So we have to realize the power of what we say. Now look at Ephesians chapter number 6. Ephesians chapter number 6. Because I want y'all to get this second heaven thing down so that you'll be able to get what belongs to you. It says, verse number Okay, I got verse number 12 here, but I want you to go to verse number 10. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against what? Spiritual hosts of wickedness in the world. Heavenly places. See? So when God give us authority to bind, we got to start binding those plans that the devil have for our life to bring destruction. I know a lot of times y'all will say, loose him, devil. You know, and, and think that, that don't mean that, but it does. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. That means something. You need to learn to tell the devil to get his hand off your business. Amen. Get his hands off your finances. Get his hands off of your, your, your children. Get his hands off of your business. You need to learn to fight spiritual warfare. Amen. It says our fight is against principalities. You know what principalities are? Principalities are, are areas where demons are in charge. The Bible talks about whenever the, the angel, when Joe, not Joe, when, um, tell me who it was, that prayed. 
Daniel, when Daniel prayed, the angel was trying to bring the answer back, but he said that I came in fight and got in a fight with the prince of Persia. That was the angel found a demonic force because there are, there are spirits that claim certain areas. And Daniel couldn't get the answer to his prayer right away because Angel Gabriel was fighting against demonic spirits to try to bring the answer. And then what Angel did, what Gabriel did, was he got Michael, the archangel, to come and fight the prince of Persia for him while he delivered the message. There are prince, that's what principalities are. It's demonic spirits over certain areas. I remember when we, um, when we started first going out witnesses, when we witnessed in certain areas, we could tell that there were demonic spirits operating in those areas. When we got to, I hope it's not like that now, but when we started witnessing over in Alma, there was a spirit of bondage over there, like, like alcohol and drugs and things like that, that you could see in the area. We went into housing projects and things like that and witnessing stuff, and you could see that spirit at work in that area. And so sometimes you have to take authority over those spirits in that area before you begin to, to see the manifestation of whatever it is you're trying to do. But that's what a principality is. It's talking about a spiritual demonic force. And then it says, not only against them, it says against powers. That's talking about something spiritual. Against rulers of the darkness of this age. What do you think the rulers of the darkness of this age is? That's still talking about demonic spirits, demonic oppression, pride. That's talking about somebody that's, that's, that's in position that's controlled by demonic forces. And then it says against spiritual hosts. You know that's talking about in the spirit realm. So we got to learn how not to focus on the natural realm and focus on the spirit realm and so we can start binding things. Because see, if you can bind the spirit, you can win the person. See, the person is controlled by the spirit. And if a person have a homosexual demon, a homosexual spirit operating in them, they got a lying spirit working in them, they got a spirit of bondage working in them, sometimes you got to get on your knees and take authority over that spirit before you see a change in the person. Amen. Jesus cast out the devils. That's what we got to learn to do more often because we have authority. Well, what you think he was doing? That was spiritual warfare. You got to learn how to deal. You have to realize. Look, and just think about it. When Jesus cast out a devil, where did he go? He didn't go up to Mars. He didn't go to paradise. He went back in that spirit realm. That's where he is. He had to be somewhere you can't see it. And right now, there are demonic forces in this building. There are angels in this building. We just can't see them. They're in a different dimension. It's a different realm unless God exposed them to us like he did Elijah's, uh, Elijah's servant. Because Elijah told his servant, said, they are more with us than it is with them. And the man was looking and said, well, 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 Master, I don't see nobody but me and you. And the Lord said, open up his eyes. And he was able to see into the spirit realm where he saw horses and chariots surrounding Elisha. That spirit realm is alive. It is real. Don't you think it's not real? It is real. Sometimes you can go into a place. That's why you need to stay out of these nightclubs. That's why you need to stay out of these, these beer joints and stuff like that. Because a lot of times you can get yourself in an in a, in a area that's controlled by a spirit and you'll find yourself doing things that you wouldn't normally do. Be careful where you go. Be careful what you see. Be careful what you do. Be careful what you look at. Because exposure to your eyes and exposure to your ears get down into your spirit. That's how demonic forces work. And you can't see it with the natural eye, but it exists. But you know, Jesus told us, say what? Whatever we bind, when we bind it, when we take authority over it in the earth, he back us up and he take authority over it in the spirit. We can change our situation. We can change our circumstances. We can, re we can see the promises of God manifesting in our lives. Hallelujah. Fight. Our fight is in the spirit realm. Now also, I want you to see this. Because we talked about three things that we need. We need to understand that there is a spirit realm. 
We need to understand that that second heaven, that heaven that Jesus was talking about, we can exercise authority over, is a spirit realm. But then the th next thing we need to realize we talked about is the power of the spoken word. We need to be able to say what God says because God honors his word. That's why you hear me say all the time, sickness and disease cannot live in my body. My body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Therefore, sickness and disease cannot live in my body. Aches and pains cannot live in my body because my body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. So aches and pains cannot live in my body. That's fighting spiritual warfare right there. That's putting my word out there. And God honors my word. Don't be a scared. Don't be a scared. <laughs> don't be a scared to say it. If God said it, you ought to have the power and the faith to say it too. Amen. That's what faith is. Faith is duplicating and replicating what God said and what God did. Jesus said over in St. John chapter number 12, I believe it's 13, where he says, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. Well, how can we do the same works that Jesus did? Because we have the same power. See, Jesus asked his disciples, say, can you be baptized with the same baptism I'm baptized with? And they say we are able. Well, that baptism is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And Jesus said whatever he do, he did it by the power of the Father. He didn't do it on his own power. He did what the power. Jesus did not come into earth and act as God. Jesus came into the earth acting as a man anointed by God to be an example for the rest of us. But the thing is, Jesus said, the devil have nothing in me. And Jesus had pure faith. He didn't have that faith mixed with all kind of stuff, mixed with doubt, mixed with unbelief. And that's why he was managed to do things that we are yet trying to get to a point where we can do, but we are qualified to do it. We have the power to do it. We have the authority to do it. We just need to have the faith to do it. Hallelujah. And the third thing is consistency, the power of consistency. Go to Hebrews chapter number 10. Because the, the promises of God does not always happen overnight. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 35. I really like this best in the King James Version, but look at the New King James Version now. It said, Do not cast away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance. Now, the, 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 New King, the King James Version says, For you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Cast not away your confidence. Don't cast away your faith. Even after you have done what God said do, does not mean God going to do it on your time limit. So he said, don't give up on your confidence. Keep on believing God. Keep on believing God. Keep on believing God. Keep on saying what God said. I was, was, was giving my testimony about the time when God healed me of arthritis in my ankles. And the, when the doctor showed me the arthritis, I told God, I said, God, the doctor said there's no cure. But you said you can do all things. You said with well, you all things are possible. You said healing is the children's bread. So, Lord, I received my healing in the name of Jesus. But the pain was still there. And I was walking with a limp because the pain was there and it was still hurting. But every time I thought about it, I said, Lord, I received my healing. Lord, I thank you for healing me. I believe I receive it. I kept saying that. And I kept saying that for about two or three months. Then one Saturday morning when I woke up, the pain was gone and it never came back. That's probably been 10 or 12 years ago. But I kept saying the same thing. I was consistent. I didn't keep going back and say, Lord, would you heal me? I said, Lord, I received my healing. Because the Bible says when you pray, believe that you receive when you pray. So I got to believe it's mine even before it is manifested. So sometimes it takes time for the promise to be manifested. So, so Hebrew writer says, don't give up on your confidence. It says, even after you have done what God said do, even after you have paid your tithe and you're still struggling with your finances, keep paying your tithe. 
because God made a promise to tithe payers that he didn't make to nobody else. Amen. When you are kind to somebody and they are nasty to you, you don't turn to start being nasty to them. You keep doing what God says. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. You keep doing what God says, and then you wait for the manifestation. You look for the turnaround. You expect the turnaround. Don't give up. One more scripture and then I'll be through. Go to the book of Mark. This is one of my favorite scriptures. Chapter number four. Beginning at verse number 26. Now listen to this. He said the kingdom of God. He didn't say the kingdom of heaven. He said the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day and the seed shall sprout and grow. He himself does not know how for the earth yields crops by itself. First the blade, then the ear, after that full corn in the head. But when the grain ripens immediately, he puts in the sickle and the harvest has come. This is the way the kingdom of God works. You put that word of God in your heart. And when you put the word of God in your heart, because your heart is the ground. And when you put the word of God in your heart, you may not see a manifestation right then. But you keep on watering it. You keep on believing it. And you'll see after a while, it'll start out and you'll see a little sprout of faith showing up. And then after the sprout shows up, then you'll begin to see, like they said, the stalk. It's a growing process. And then you'll start seeing your faith grow, and now you're ready to reap the harvest. But don't go back and dig up the seed to try to find out what's going on. You trust the ground. You trust your heart. You trust the Word of God. You trust the Spirit of God on the inside of you and expect the manifestation. Don't give up. Hold on. All right. I don't know why I'm so excited. I just missed one church service, you know. <laughs> Hallelujah. God gave us promises for us to receive the promises. We don't want to be like the children of Israel. God told them, say, I have given you the land that flowed with milk and honey. I have given you the, 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 uh, the, the land of the Canaanites, and I have given you that land. But instead of them believing God, their unbelief caused them to die out in the wilderness. They died not having received the promise because they had to go into the land and fight for it. They had to dispossess the people that were possessing it so that they could possess it. And when they saw the giants in the land, their heart was faint. And they, they looked at the size of the giants rather than looking at the size of God. So that's what we got to do when God make a promise to us. It might seem like the obstacle is too big. It might seem like, Lord, this is just too big for me. I don't have the faith for this. Hold on to your faith. And if you don't have the faith for it to start with, just keep little by little until your faith grow. Keep saying it because saying it increases your faith because faith come by what? Hearing. You don't have to hear it from somebody else. You can hear it from yourself. You can keep saying it. I heard, um, I think it was Joyce Meyer, say that when she first got saved, she was still smoking cigarettes. And she said that she did not want to smoke cigarettes, but she was addicted. So what she kept saying was, I don't have to smoke these cigarettes while she was smoking them. She kept telling herself, I'm not bound by these cigarettes while she was smoking it. But then after a while, one day it rose up in her and she threw it in the toilet and she'd never go back and get it. See, you got to learn how to increase your faith. You got to learn how to build your faith. You build your faith by being around the Word of God. You build your faith by being exposed to the Word of God. You build your faith by listening to gospel music. You build your faith by listening to faithful preaching, correct preaching. You build your faith by repeating what God has said. You know, when we were little children, they grow, they, they, they raise us up saying the 23rd Psalm. They raise us saying the 100th Psalm. 
We talked about the 91st Psalm. These are things that they gave us and those things get into your heart. And once they get into your heart, then it's hard for anybody to take it out. That's why it's important that you come to Bible study. That's why it's important that you come to church. That's why it's important that you spend time reading the Word of God, listening to the Word of God, being around the Word of God. Because the more you are exposed to the Word of God, the more you become a part of the Word. I remember that when I was going to college, I met this little girl. <coughs> And I had never seen nobody like her before. I mean, she was, she was just sweet. Had a real good personality. And I was in a chemistry class. And in the chemistry class, they poured some sugar into water. Well, when they pour the sugar into water, the water goes to the bottom. So what they did was stir the sugar. And when they stirred the sugar, the sugar and the water became one. You couldn't see where the sugar started and the water stopped. It just became one. And they say that water has now become saturated with the sugar. Then they poured more sugar into the water. And when they poured more sugar in the water and stirred it, then the water became gelled, sort of like a jello. And they say now the water is super saturated. And I say, that girl's super saturated. I think I'm going to marry that girl. <laughs> We need to get to the point where we become not just saturated, but super saturated with the Word of God. If we're super saturated with the Word of God, so when somebody says something to us, ain't nothing going to come out but the Word. Because see, what happens is we have become one with the Word. Lord, Father God, I thank you right now. In the name of your Son, Jesus, I thank you for your Word. I thank you for your people that listen to your Word. And Father God, I pray that we will realize that there is a time and there's a place that you have the promises of God set for us, but you have equipped us, Father God, to endure the time and to use our faith to pull and pull it from where it is to where we need to be. We thank you, Lord God, because you have made provision for us. And we pray, thank you, Father God, that all of our needs are met in you through Christ Jesus. Now, Father, I pray that your word have gone forth in ears that will not only hear, but become doers of your word, that we can walk in the blessings and promises of God. And we thank you for it right now. In Jesus' name, I pray. So we want to say to the people that are on Facebook, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Thank you for joining us. All right, do anybody have any questions or comments? I'm not going to press you too hard tonight because I went kind of long. Sister Jenkins. That's where it is. God got to set aside for you. But see, the problem, the problem is not with God giving. It's with us receiving. See, God set it there for you. And whenever you get the faith, you learn how to pull it out. And then when you start doing what God tells you to do to, to get it, then you have the patience to wait on God. Because God is faithful. And whatever God has said, he will do. Amen. Anybody else? That's good. Amen. Sister Alicia. That's right. All right.